Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here. Welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. Happy 4th of July to all of our American friends. And today I wanted to go over the Jordan rules. The concepts on defense the Pistons created to defend the single most devastating wing scorer we've ever seen in the NBA in Michael Jordan. They figured if they can stop him, the other teammates on the Bulls wouldn't beat them and they would win those series. And it proved true for most of the time until the Bulls finally broke through. That said, there are some concepts I'm going to show you that they definitely employed using the 1989 Game 6 Eastern Conference Finals where the Pistons were able to beat the Bulls in six. Let's give you some context. Uh, Doug Collins was still coaching the Bulls. Phil Jackson was on the bench but hadn't taken over yet. Scottie Pippen gets injured in the very first minute of the game and is unable to help them. It would have made a big difference. And Michael Jordan had a groin injury he was battling as well. Now let's not also forget that Doug Collins had Michael Jordan initiating the offense from the point guard position for much of this season, and Michael put in, I think, 10 or 11 straight triple doubles during this year, but it also served to wear him out, as we'll see in this game. Let's start with the post-ups. It's clear their rule was to double team immediately, and Bill Lane Beer was their designated doubler, and that meant whomever he was guarding stayed near their free throw line to get the pass out. Brad Sellers gets into the lane for the runner. This time it's Cartwright who unleashes his tornado of a shot. And in the fourth, it's a triple team as Isaiah Thomas mistakenly doubles one pass away off of John Paxson. And to show you just how good Michael was, on these two post-ups, the double team didn't even matter one bit. The Pistons would also show Michael a quick double with a big man if he was bringing the ball up the court, something he did more than any other guard in the Bulls in 1989. The idea was to get it out of his hands quickly. Without Scotty out there, he was left to feed the ball to non-threats like Dave Corzine and Brad Sellers. Here's Mahorn again stunting at him, and you can see the entire defense's attention shift to Michael, opening up shots for teammates. The quick double was relatively effective getting it out of his hands, and here's an example where they didn't do that and Michael just destroys Joe Dumars and Bill Lambeer with a crossover. On this early double, Michael doesn't get rid of the ball, but you can start to see evidence where it was wearing him down, perhaps as his groin injury got worse. The Pistons also like to double Michael off of the cutter, and normally if the ball is on the wing, it should be a layup. But the offensive spacing wasn't always perfect, as Charles Davis should have been spread to the weak side corner. As a result, Lane Beer can rotate easily to stop the pass for a layup, and all they had was a rush shot as the shot clock expired. The Bulls were prepared for the double off of the cutter as they set a flare screen for Sellers after he cut through. This forced Isaiah to rotate, leaving Craig Hodges wide open, and he killed them repeatedly in the first half. With Scottie Pippen out of the game so early, the Pistons repeatedly left Brad Sellers wide open to use his man to double-team Michael Jordan. And while he didn't have a terrible game, they needed Sellers to be much better on these field goal attempts. The Pistons also made the decision to help one pass away with a guard when Michael attacked from the wing off the dribble. This ended up being effective in getting it out of Michael's hands, but his teammates did a nice job making the Pistons pay. However, Detroit was playing the long game here, hoping to eventually wear Michael out. Another weakness in the Pistons' defense was the pick and roll when Lane Beer was guarding the screener. He simply wasn't mobile enough to cause Michael problems, and the screen itself was able to get Dumars out of position enough for Michael to attack and do his magic. Another part of the Jordan rules was simply to gang up on him as he attacked the lane. Routinely, if he got penetration, they'd have three guys come over to stop him, willing to give up passes to his teammates, and this also served to wear him down by the end of the game. All of these methods might have given the Bulls hope early, but you can see by these plays that Michael started to tire, and having to battle his groin injury with no Scottie Pippen to help proved too much of an uphill battle. 
but let's not ignore that Joe Dumars was the best wing defender of his era and could be very effective on Jordan all on his own. The Pistons were able to get enough key stops down the stretch to pull out this series and the Bulls were left pondering what steps they needed to take to eventually overcome the Detroit Pistons. So there you have it sports fans, the next year Phil Jackson took over, slowly put the triangle offense in and the rest as we can say is history. What was curious to me in this game was why they didn't post up Michael Moore because he was virtually deadly down there, they were getting great shots, and why they didn't run more pick and roll with Lane Beer guarding the screener. Those are the kind of things that maybe Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsworth were scratching their head about and led to the change to bring Phil Jackson in. Well, thanks for joining us. Have a great 4th of July weekend. We'll have lots more coming up going into next week, so stay tuned. And don't forget, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You win.